Okay, we're going to be working out a pipe welding procedures again. This is chapter five, uphill welding the root bead on heavy wall pipe. Your book's defining heavy wall pipe as uh, three eighths of an inch or larger. And that is 0.375. Uh, welding on schedule 80 pipe. Schedule 80 pipe is point four three two so they consider they consider schedule 80 pipe to be heavy wall pipe um, we're talk, going to be talking about the horizontal fixed position meaning the pipe is like this and the weld can be either vertically up or vertically down and this discussion is going to be about welding in the vertical up position We're on page 31 in your text. I have a question right now. Schedule 40 considered heavy wall pipe? Schedule 40 is not considered heavy wall pipe. Schedule 40 has a wall thickness of 2.80. So it's not considered heavy wall pipe. So you can weld that downhill? Yes, you can weld that downhill without any, without any problem at all. In fact, uh, in our downhill pipe welding class, this is what we practice on. And then as we get deeper into it, then we go to a downhill on 8 inch or 10 inch or 12 inch, whatever other pipe we have available. But most of the training is done on, on, on the 6 inch uh, Schedule 40 pipe. And actually, in my opinion, it's easier to weld Schedule 80 pipe that vertical up than it is to weld Schedule 40 pipe vertical up uh, be, because of the extra heat sink that you have from the thicker pipe. Are you teaching Schedule 40 uphill to prepare further on from when you're using Schedule 80? Is that why we're learning uphill? That's right. Schedule 40. That's right. You're learning Schedule 40 uphill as a precursor to the Schedule 80. And uh, you're learning all the techniques here. And, and, and usually by, your, by the time you, you're through Schedule 40, Schedule 80 is a snap. Because I do believe that, in my opinion, that Schedule 40 is a little bit tougher than Schedule 80. And the, and the main reason for doing Schedule 80 is because that is the main test that any of these companies will give you. A uh, six inch schedule 80 pipe with 6010 and 7018, that's pretty much the industry standard. That, and uh, a lot of times they'll test you on a two inch boiler tube. And there's such a thing, thing now that they call it, they call it a super coupon. It's a two inch schedule 160 pipe test. And uh, if they, it, under ASME, if you take that test and pass, you're qualified for all thicknesses and all diameters of pipe. Mm -hmm. yep, either in gas tungsten arc or uh, I just heard from a company in Chicago that, that asked if we had any welders that could pass that test because they've got jobs all over the country including down in Aruba and they want they, their test is, is on that super coupon uh, with a 6010 root vertical up and 7018 fill and cap. So yeah okay good question. All right, let's flip the page to uh, page 32. It says general procedure for uphill root welding. Uh, now, as, as we've just dis been discussing, we're going to use a 6-inch Schedule 80 pipe. Your book talks about using 8-inch eight uh, Schedule 60. So the, 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 pipe, the pipe coupons are a little bit different, but the techniques are all the same. Reading the last paragraph on that page, it says three basic welding positions are used to weld the root bead when the pipe is in the horizontal or 5G position. The weld is started by welding in the overhead or 4G position. Then gradually there is a change to the vertical, which is a 3G position, welding in the uphill direction. And from this position there is another gradual transition uh, to weld in the flat or the 1G position. So as your book states, what you do here, you're going to start down here and this would be your 4G overhead position and if you lock your wrist and use a slight angle like this and then come, up, come across it will automatically transition to the 3G or vertical up push and then you want to maintain your push angle, push angle, push angle and then that when you're up here now, now you're in the 1G or flat position. Okay Flipping the page to 34, the keyhole, 
It says, before going further, it is necessary to say a word about the keyhole. As seen in figure 5.4, the keyhole is a teardrop or pearl-shaped enlargement of the root opening ahead of the bead. When welding a root bead, the keyhole is necessary in order to obtain the required weld penetration. Uh, for those of you that don't already know what the keyhole is, your book shows it like this, and you're welding vertically up, and it's basically an enlargement of the root opening here, where your welding electrode is blasting through that land, and when you see this keyhole, you, the most important thing in my view is to, is to make sure that it's burning into both plates or both pipe. If it's not burning into both sides, then you're going to have lack of fusion on one side. You've got to be very careful and watch that keyhole. And if it's only going on one side, then that means that, it's, that, that your weld is simply laying against this other side. And if that doesn't matter what position you're in, if, if you see that, that means that you're getting a lack of fusion in this, in this plate or pipe over here. So when you're welding, you got to watch that keyhole and make sure that that keyhole is going into both coupons just like that. And of course, keep listening for the sound of penetration. If you don't hear that sound of penetration, you're not getting through. Stop, make whatever adjustments you have to, and, and then start again. Um, starting the root bead. It says, since the weld is started at the lowest position on the pipe, it is usually necessary for the welder to be in a kneeling or crouching position. Whether kneeling or crouching, he should or... This book is not politically correct. He or she should be situated comfortably in order to avoid any unsteadiness in manipulating the welding electrode. Getting into a comfortable position, then, is the first step in welding a root bead. So you want to make sure you're comfortable. But also, you want to make sure that your arms are flexible. Uh, if any of you have ever played baseball before, you know that you can't swing the bat if you're holding your, your elbows in, into your body. So you want to get out there to where you can move, and you've got freedom to move and manipulate that welding electrode. And as you're coming up, this, as you're coming up that pipe, that elbow's got to come up with you. If that elbow's not coming up with you, you're not using the correct rod angle. So, let's see. If you look at figure 5.6, it shows a piece of pipe, and it shows that our weld was started at the 630 position just a little bit beyond bottom dead center and the gentleman here is using a five to, five to ten degree drag angle and then he comes on up the pipe and that's fine. Uh, usually we will have our tacks right in here and we'll start right in the middle of the tack which is what I recommend. Uh, our tacks are going, to be, are going to be full penetration, they're going to be ground and feathered, we're going to start in the middle of the tack, we're going to burn through that that tack before we reach the end of the pipe and you just want to lock your wrist so that your, your rod angle is about like this and then it will transition on to the push just as we're going on up. So uh, my technique for welding pipe is a little bit different from, from the gentleman that wrote this book uh, but eventually you'll, you'll develop your own techniques uh, and uh, it may be a little bit of what he preaches and it may be a little bit of what I teach. Reading from the first paragraph on page 36, it says, In addition to preheating the bevel, maintaining the long arc length stabilizes the arc and allows the gaseous shield to form. No filler metal is transformed uh, from the electrode to the workpiece when the long arc is maintained in the overhead position. Uh, I think he meant transferred there. Um, if you go up to the top of the page, it says, The arc is struck in the joint and never on a tack weld. Well, I don't agree with that. Uh, and as I said, this is how this gentleman likes to, likes to do his, his work. It says a long arc length should be maintained for a short period after the arc has been struck. During this time, uh, he should weave the electrode back, backward and forward to preheat the bevel ahead of the weld. So he likes, that's, that's just his basic technique. Um, mine is striking right in, the, right in the center of that tack, coming out slowly, as you're coming out slowly, you're generating heat. You're dumping heat into that, into that tack and into the surrounding bevel. Uh, you blow through the tack before you reach the end of it, and then you're off and running. Um, dropping down to the next uh, subject, it says welding, uphill welding the root bead. 
it says, uh, the middle of this first paragraph reads, there is no back and forth motion across the pipe joint, only a linear or straight movement along the joint in the direction of welding. And that's very important and certainly something I agree with. If you're, if you're welding this pipe, you can use a little whip. That's fine. Using a little whip is fine. But if you get too large of a keyhole in here, you don't want to try to chase the size of that keyhole. Chasing the size of the keyhole will only enlarge the keyhole. Uh, you want to whip it out, come back and pause, whip it out, come back and pause, and that will shut that keyhole up for you until it gets down to the size that you want. If you are using a whip, only use a slight, slight whip, about one and a half to, to, to two, to, two diameters of the welded electrode. You don't want to go any farther than that. It's more of an oscillation than it is a, a, a full-fledged whipping motion. Uh, personally, I prefer to use, use the push. Use the push as much as you possibly can and only resort to whipping as you're coming into attack or if the keyhole starts to get too large on you. Uh, let's see. Going to the next page, it says, uh, if the current setting is correct, it should not be necessary to resort to whipping in order to control the uh, puddle and the size of the keyhole. Uh, now this is going to be an important page. There's four questions that come off of this page. It says, while welding, the welder should pay careful attention to the puddle and to the keyhole. As the electrode moves along at a steady pace, it melts the edges of the bevel in front of the arc and the molten metal flows backward, uh, back toward the, toward the back of the arc. Uh, there, there it enters the puddle and flows into the root opening. As the electrode moves on, the molten metal in the, in the puddle that is left behind solidifies to form the weld bead. Since the bead will be deposited in a circular pattern around the pipe, the tilt of the electrode must be changed gradually to maintain the correct electrode angle. If the keyhole size becomes too small, the electrode angle should be decreased slightly by pointing the electrode more directly towards the keyhole. Also, the welding speed may, uh, may be decreased slightly. Should the keyhole become enlarged, the remedy is to increase the electrode angle slightly. If this is not effective, the welding should be stopped and the current setting reduced before proceeding again. Uh, this is similar to what we talked about in, uh, where's my pointer? What we talked about in, in 2G welding. As you're coming up, up along here like so, if you've got, a, if you've got the, a good keyhole, that's fine. Just keep on going. However, if that keyhole starts to get too small, if you're not getting enough penetration, point the electrode more back into the keyhole, back into the face of the puddle as you're, as you're moving along. That will force more metal through here, and it will, it will energize the, the, uh, the weld bead a little bit more, that puddle a little bit more. You'll get better penetration and more heat deposited. If, on the other hand, you're getting too big of a keyhole here, then you want to point the electrode away from it, and that will reduce the amount of heat and uh, help you to control that puddle a little bit more. And as we're going across here now, as you're coming up, it's, it's, it's drag across the bottom, lock your wrist, and then you'll go to push, 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 and then as you're coming up and around, you still want to maintain a push because you're still going uphill. So it's still push, 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 all the way up here, and you're pushing all the way over. So at no time should you be back like this. At no time should you be trying to drag it, unless you're not getting your penetration. If you're not getting your penetration, then you can, can roll it over and try to get more fusion like that. But generally, especially on the top, this will result in, in overheating that, and the combination of the force of the arc, the heat, and gravity is going to cause you to blow through here and here. So the correct technique then is drag it, lock your wrist, push, 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 all the way around like so. And another thing I recommend, especially if you're welding Schedule 40 pipe, is to, is to weld the pipe in quarters. Weld the bottom quarter and then weld the opposite top quarter. Then come back and weld this bottom quarter. So that leaves just, just this top quarter up here to weld. The reason you want to quarter your pipe when, you, when you're practicing and learning this stuff is because it'll spread the heat out uh, so, so that no one section gets too hot. It will spread the shrinkage forces out so that it's going to be drawn together uniformly and it'll give you better control of the puddle. If you were to weld, start on the bottom and weld straight up, well, you're, you're heating this pipe all the way, all the way as you come around. And that will tend to make you fall through 
at the 10 and 2 o'clock positions. But if you quarter the pipe, it will help you to avoid that. Now when you're out in the field, that's different. If you're out in the field and you're welding um, 20 foot lengths of pipe, then it's not necessary to quarter it. Uh, but I would recommend that if you're out, out there in the field, you still leave the easiest part for last. Weld, weld this little quarter here, and then weld this half. And then take your flashlight and look down through this, this, this easy part and inspect, visually inspect your root. Make sure that you've got a good root in there before you finally close it up, before you finally weld that last little bit. That way you, you, you're pretty much going to ensure that your root bead is, is, is a good sound root bead, especially if they go to x-ray your stuff. Um, you don't want to have any failures on your x-ray. So I would recommend that, that you always stop and, and, uh, and check that before you zip it up. Okay, going back to your text here. Still on page 37, and it says, Whipping is sometimes used in overhead welding to reduce the keyhole size and to control the puddle. However, this practice is not recommended and should not be used unnecessarily in the overhead position. When excessive whipping appears to be necessary, it is best to reduce the current setting. So again, as, as I say, I like to just use that steady motion, but sometimes you do have to whip it. If you're having to whip it too much, you're probably too hot. If you're too hot, turn it down, because even if you're able to control it, if you're too hot, uh, you can look inside there and, and, and your bead will be flat. It's going to spread out and be flat. You're not going to get any depth of penetration. You're not really going to put a lot inside. So uh, check that. Make sure your heat, is, your heat is correct. Now it says stop and restart. Uh, when welding the root bead, the electrode is consumed and will need replacement. This necessarily involves breaking the arc. Uh, welding is also stopped after a tie-in has been made uh, with another weld, such as a tack weld. However, the procedure for making a tie-in will be treated later on in this chapter. It says to, weld the stop, uh, to stop the weld, the arc is broken by making a quick stabbing motion through the keyhole with the electrode and then withdrawing it quickly to clear the work. We've been doing this straight along. You just poke it through, boom, boom. Just like, just like you're punching something, boom, boom, just real quick. This procedure, um, by this procedure, a full-size keyhole is left so that the complete penetration can be obtained when the weld is started again. Now I've already explained how to restart uh, a, a weld before, but, but real briefly, and let me, let me say this again in case you've, you've missed it in the previous chapters. You've got your weld and your keyhole is right here. What you're going to do is you're going you're to strike your arc about a quarter of an inch behind where you left off and then you want to just pause right here. Don't worry about that weld metal building up. It's going to build up. We'll take a grinder, we'll grind it off of there later on. But then think of that electrode as a hot knife slicing through butter. You want to slice through the tip of that weld where you left off. Get your electrode down here in this keyhole now and pause for a moment. Allow a little bit of that welded electrode to melt so that it ties into everything. And once it's tied into everything, then you can go ahead and take off again. That's how you make your tie-ins. Okay, reading from the bottom of this page, page 37 says, to restart the weld, the arc should be struck on the part of the bead that has been cleaned. Maintaining a slightly longer than normal arc, the electrode should be brought forward to the edge of the keyhole and held there momentarily to allow the arc to stabilize and the gaseous shield to form. It is also held at this length in this position to allow time for the liquid puddle to form at the edge of the keyhole. When sufficient liquid metal appears at the key edges of the keyhole, but not before, the arc can be shortened to its normal length and the electrode manipulation can be started to resume the weld. Okay. Questions so far? Nope. Okay, next subject is vertical uphill weaving of the root bead when necessary. You don't normally re weave a root bead. Um, except in gas metal arc. Gas metal arc you do want to, you, you can weave a root bead, but typically in shielded metal arc you don't. Uh, the nature of the welding process changes gradually from overhead welding to vertical welding as the bead progresses from the 5 o'clock position to the 4 o'clock position. As the weld moves toward the vertical position it becomes apparent that the liquid metal will tend to flow downward at a faster rate uh, than when welding in the overhead position. 
with a continuous application of heat resulting from the slow steady movement of the electrode starts to cause an overflow of the molten metal the remedy is to result, uh, resort to the whipping procedure. Um, the whipping procedure must always be used when welding in the vertical uphill portion of the pipe. It is continued until the weld is stopped at 12 o'clock position. He likes to use the whip, I don't. Uh, and forgive me, I misspoke myself. I thought we were going to be talking about weaving, not whipping. Um, so he likes to whip it. Uh, personally, I don't, but uh, you can if you want to. Dropping down to the bottom of the page, page 38, it says the electrode should not pause directly over the keyhole because the initial heat in this area will cause the intense heat of the arc to melt the edges around the keyhole. This will result in excessive penetration and possible burn through. Um, the objective of whipping is to allow the molten pool of metal to cool sufficiently to lose some of its fluidity. When the molten metal in the puddle is somewhat mushy, a, a further de a deposit of uh, filler metal from the electrode will not cause it to overflow. The length of the stroke when whipping should not be excessive. If it is excessive, the hot metal liquid in the puddle will be exposed to atmosphere as a result of the removal of the gaseous shield. Rapid oxidation will result, uh, which leads to porosity in the weld. Excessive whipping can also cause slag entrapment in the weld. So those are a couple of reasons why I don't really care for it unless it becomes necessary. Uh, and it becomes necessary if you start to lose control of the keyhole. Dropping down to the bottom of, that, of this paragraph, it says the length of stroke when whipping should not exceed one and one half electrode diameters and preferably less in order to minimize the effect of uncovering the gaseous shield from the weld to prevent slag entrapment. Now there are a couple of questions on your test from uh, page 38 and 39. Um, flat welding the root bead. So now, now we've, we, we've done the bottom, we've come up the sides, and now we're coming across the top. Okay, conditions approaching flat welding occur as the weld progresses to the vicinity of one o'clock position. When this occurs, the molten pool of metal becomes even more difficult to control, and the whipping procedure must be continued until the weld is stopped at the 12 o'clock position. It does become more, more difficult to control because, uh, because of the burn through. Uh, I've already mentioned about the, the accumulation of heat, gravity, and, uh, and the force of the arc coming off the end of the electrode. If you're not careful, those, thing, those three things will combine to cause, the, cause your weld to sag, to get excessive penetration, or, or even to blow through it. Um, one remedy, I, know, I don't know that it's mentioned in your textbook or not, but one remedy is to remember to move as fast as you can without leaving the puddle behind. If you can move as fast as you can and still get that penetration, still hearing that sound of penetration, uh, you're less likely to have blow through as a result. You got to remember that the amount of heat input is a combination of, of what your amperage is set at and how fast you're moving. So if your amperage is set correctly but you're moving really, really slow, that's the same as reaching out there and turning your machine up 15 or 20 amps. So if you're having problems with it falling through on you, remember to move as fast as you can without leaving the puddle behind. Um, when welding a single V groove, and all of our pipe joints are single V grooves, open butt joint in the flat position, the molten metal will tend to drip through the opening causing the bottom of the weld to build up and form a high crown. That's excessive, in, excessive penetration. Um, and this is primarily caused if the current is too high. Uh, from what has been said above, it is evident that the welder must watch the puddle and the keyhole for signs of excessive penetration. He must continue the whipping procedure to control the pool of molten metal. If signs of excessive penetration occur, he may increase the electrode angle somewhat, as shown in figure 5-10B. Um, the normal electrode angle for welding in this position is shown in 5-10A. If this does not help, the weld should be stopped and the current setting reduced. Excessive whipping should not be used to correct the situation. Um, as I've mentioned in the past, if you're pointing more towards the, towards the puddle, you're going to get excessive penetration, uh, especially in the, in the overhead position or in the top position, flat position, because when you, when you have the well electrode pointed back into the face of the puddle, you're going to make that puddle more hot. You've got the force of the arc coming off the end of the electrode itself, and those are going to combine to really cause excessive penetration. 
And this diagram shows that if you turn it away a little bit, you're going to uh, slow down the amount of uh, penetration that you get. You're going to have less heat being deposited into the face of that puddle as you're coming across. Tie-in procedures, page 41. Incidentally, uh, there's two questions off of page 40. The process of joining a bead, in this case the root bead, is called a tie-in. The previous weld may be a tack weld or it may be the first half of the root bead. In either case, the two welds must be brought together smoothly and without discontinuities. In the last chapter, I talked about a toenail. If you're welding across like this, here's your weld, and you, you want to come into a, to a tack that you've feathered. Okay, you, you feathered your tack and, and you didn't feather it quite enough. Well, you're coming across, coming across, coming across, if you don't tie into that properly, you'll have what we call a toenail right there. An area uh, of reduced through thickness. Instead of it blending in properly, as it should, and creating a solid, seamless uh, bead on the inside of the pipe, you'll have what we call a toenail, where, where the root bead has been reduced in its through thickness. Um, it is easier to pick a good tie-in if the edges of the existing weld are ground to a feather edge, as shown in figure 511. This is done with a hand grinder using a thin grinding wheel. We recommend that you use a 1 8 inch grinding disc. Uh, when the ends of the existing bead are ground to a thin edge, the metal in the bead will heat up more rapidly uh, than in the case of an unground edge, where there is relatively large bulk of metal. Sometimes Facilities are not available for grinding the edges of, of the existing bead, and the tie-in must be made to an uh, unground edge, which is much more difficult to, to do. Since this situation does occur, the beginner should first practice making a tie-in on an unground edge. Well, we don't do that. We, we stress the, 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 the tying in, uh, feathering these tacks down, feathering the ends of your weld down, and tying in like that, because it is easier. But you should also know how to make a tie-in uh, to something that's not been ground. Uh, say, 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 you've, say you've poked a, you've got your keyhole there and you've poked that rod through and, and, and you've got a tie to this and, and, the, and the edge of that well looking, looking into it is nice and thick and fat. Well, how are you going to tie into that? There are some techniques, I've discussed them in other, in, in other chapters, but let, let's read what it says here. Um, basically, you're going to use your whipping technique and, and preheat that. It says that uh, sometimes the tie-in must be made on approaching the keyhole, while at other times it must be made approaching from the opposite end, the heavy end of the bead. These conditions are shown in figure 512. Two different welding techniques must be used in these cases. Um, when the root bead approaches the keyhole, maintain the same speed of welding uh, used to deposit the bead. Weld toward the previous weld at this speed and then gradually close the keyhole. As the keyhole is beginning to close up, watch the liquid puddle. When the liquid puddle appears to have joined the previous weld in a smooth pattern, withdraw the electrodes by simultaneously reversing the electrode beyond the point of the tie-in and lengthening the arc somewhat. Then break the arc with a sudden movement. So you're going to come into that. Where's my little pointer? Ah. So we're going to, what they're talking about here is we're going to be coming across like this. And actually you can step forward and preheat this with a, with a slight whipping motion. And, and your other bead is going to be coming in closer and closer and closer. Keep welding until the trailing edge of your puddle ties into that. Uh, so that you, you continually preheat that. And then you're going to whip it out and just break your arc like so. And in that manner you should be able to get a pretty good tie in. Uh, the same is true going in the, in the other directions, in the other direction. Um, let's see. When the tie-in is, on the next page, page 44, it says, when the tie-in is made at the heavy edge of the weld, the speed of welding should be decreased somewhat, a short distance away from the edge of the previous weld. This is, to, this is done to allow time for the thick edge to heat up. If the arc is too short and the welding speed too fast when approaching the tie-in, insufficient penetration will result. Uh, so those are a couple of techniques that we need to use for tying in. If possible, I would feather those tacks. Not always possible. Uh, so you might want to practice both ways. 
we don't we don't stress it too much um, except sometimes when you're welding around your pipe you you just don't have enough electrode to to to, to reach one of those tacks so you're going to poke through and that's a good time to practice coming out of those coming out of those tacks whereas tying into them if it's if it's uh, feather the way we we recommend it's usually pretty easy to come back out of them okay inspecting the weld any major defect should be removed before the second bead is deposited you are your own best inspector quality control begins with the craftsperson it's up to you to look at that weld uh, make sure you don't have any porosity in it. Make sure you don't have any slag entrapment in it. You can have a little undercut. A little undercut is acceptable, provided that there's no slag back in the recesses of that undercut. If there is, then you either have to remove that undercut, or pardon me, remove that slag, or at least open up that undercut so that the slag will float out with the next bead. And you got to remember that 6010 is a high penetration electrode going to really gouge into that base metal and it will remove a lot of stuff. But 7018 is a medium penetration electrode. It's not going to remove a lot of that slag. So you've got to make sure that it's relatively clean before you deposit that 7018 pass. Reading from page 44, uh, bottom paragraph, it says, if it is necessary to remove a large section or a deeply penetrating section of the root bead to correct a defect, this part of the bead must be re-welded before the second pass is deposited. If you put in your root pass and you have some IP, insufficient penetration, you may have to almost completely remove that root and redeposit it, listening for that keyhole, watching that keyhole, that sound of penetration, and depositing it over again. Um, I believe standard operating procedure is that a weld repair like that can be made three times. After that, it's got to be cut out and completely redone. So you get a couple of chances at it, but uh, it would, if, if you had problems with a, such a thing, uh, your employers would be, could become concerned. So it's best to avoid those kinds of problems by making sure you have the proper joint fit up before you ever start, you know the proper techniques, and, uh, and you're getting that good penetration. Poor fit up, wide root opening. Um, Frequent causes of poor fit up are manual flame cutting of the bevel by inexperienced operators or mistakes in measurement, measurements. That's really common. One condition encountered as the result of poor edge preparation is a wide root opening. Wide root openings are difficult to weld and in such cases a decision must be made whether to attempt the weld or to replace the entire length of pipe. Replacing the entire pipe can be very expensive and sometimes cannot be afforded. Usually this decision depends on the type of job. For example, a poor fit-up job would be unacceptable in a chemical or an atomic plant. Um, however, sometimes that, those happen. So when those happen, you, you, you have to bridge. And generally, a bridge, a bridge weld is not acceptable by code. As, I'm, as I've mentioned in previous chapters, the amount of root opening that is allowable will be, will be written on your WPS and it is usually one eighth of an inch, well generally, one eighth of an inch uh, plus or minus one sixteenth of an inch. If the root opening exceeds that, it's not allowable. Some techniques, and sometimes some companies allow it, some techniques is to grow the pipe. You can grow the pipe by, by using a rosebud, which is a, 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 an oxyacetylene heating torch, and it's got a special tip on it and you crank that up and you get it hot and then you just wash that heat over the pipe, say the last four or five feet of the pipe. By dumping that heat into the pipe you're going to cause that metal to expand. When that metal expands that gap is going to narrow. Some companies will allow that. Uh, depends on the circumstances and it depends on the criticality of the, of the uh, pipe that you're welding. They'll allow that so that it, be, that it will get close. More commonly, you can do this bridge tacking technique and, and close that gap. And then you start to weld, and that's by the, just the fact that you're welding is going to draw that together some. And then you might get that, that second edge within code, within the, re, the requirements. And you weld that out, then you can remove that, that, that first bridge tack and the, that first part of the weld and redeposit it in that manner. Um, but always keep in mind that 
you shouldn't weld anything beyond the acceptable limits of the WPS that you're working to without the direction of your supervisors. Otherwise, it could be your job. Uh, the bottom of the page shows a sequence of beads uh, that they've used to, to bridge to wide a root opening. Uh, and, and I have done this before, but it's generally using gas metal arc procedure. I have used it on some, on some plate steel, but usually you don't use it on pressure, pressure piping. Um, usually pressure piping is a cutout. You have to cut it out and just refit it and try to get the proper length. But let me read what it says here. It says, in starting the tack weld, it is first necessary to build a bridge of weld metal across the wide gap at the root. This is done by welding a number of small nuggets of weld metal on the root faces until finally one of the nuggets joins the two faces together. This procedure is shown in 515. Uh, the welding current should be reduced slightly to weld the nuggets. After the arc is struck, it is held just long enough to become stabilized and then it is shortened. A small nugget of weld metal is deposited on the root face after which the arc is quenched, meaning they just flick it out and get out of there as quick as they can. Uh, it need not be fused perfectly. Uh, the principal objective being to deposit a small lump of metal. The same procedure is then used to deposit a small nugget of metal on the opposite root, root face. After cleaning each nugget, the same procedure is used to deposit one nugget on top of another until the bridge is complete. Um, anyway, you can use that, but as I say, I wouldn't recommend it. It says, uh, towards the bottom of this page, page 46, it says, one danger encountered in welding uh, across a wide root opening is excessive penetration resulting from overheating. Uh, for this reason, the arc length uh, should be somewhat shorter than normal and the current setting should be somewhat lower than normal. In making a U-weave, and that's shown in figure 516, the electrode should be manipulated uh, to bring the arc all the way out of the molten puddle and the arc should be moved along the face of the bevel and kept away from the uh, edges of the bevel. The molten pool of metal should be allowed to solidify completely before the arc is returned to the weld zone. I have used this before uh, and, and basically basically all you're doing is is you're walking up the bevel over here and back over here and back over here and you're actually walking up the edges you're actually walking your electrode up the edges of the bevel so that you're getting away from, from, the, from the land, from the root face. So you're walking up here, that allows that to cool, then you go over to the other side and as you cross that, that root opening, that's where you're making your deposit at. And then you walk it up here because by walking up here, you're drawing off the heat and you're able to bridge a wide root opening in that manner. Um, another way of doing it is, is in the vertical down position. You can use a similar technique in the vertical down position with gas metal arc. It can be done with, with shielded metal arc, but it's a little more difficult to do. Questions so far? Best advice I can give you on two wider root opening is seek, seek the advice of your supervisors. Uh, let's see, now there are a couple of questions that come off of that section that we just, actually three questions that come off of that section we just discussed. Uh, let's go to page uh, 48 and 49. Poor fit up, wide and narrow root openings. I'm reading from page 49 now. First of, first of all, of course, the four tack welds should be welded in place. To prevent restraint cracking, the first tack weld should be made in the region of the narrow root openings. Uh, for the same reason, and because it is less difficult to obtain a start, it is desirable to weld the narrow root opening first uh, when welding the root bead. What this section is talking about is you've got a fit up and of course we're shooting for one eighth of an inch, that, hypothetically speaking, plus or minus a sixteenth. Well, if one area of it, and this is a common, common occurrence, one area may be more narrow than the rest. Well, you want to weld that, that narrow part first because again, again, as we're dumping heat into the weld mitt, that metal is going to grow and that root opening is going to close up on you. So you're going to do the narrow one first, and then you're going to move over to the, to the wider one. That way you should have an opportunity to get complete penetration on, on everything. Um, let's see. 
find out where I left off here. Uh, poor fit up. The root face is too wide. When the root face is too wide, it may be possible to correct this condition by recutting the end of the pipe. Normally, however, the pipes are welded together in the usual manner using a higher current. Uh, if it's too thin, you may have to use the whipping technique or, or use a reduced current. Uh, welding the root bead with low hydrogen electrodes, we're not going to cover that in this section. Except for one thing I, I want to mention. Actually, there's a couple things. At the bottom of page 49, the very last paragraph, it talks about suck-in. Um, using 7018 to, to, to weld a root can cause a, well, that's actually called suck-back or uh, concave root bead. And uh, what they use here in the book, I'm going to read this paragraph. It says, welding with an arc that is too long can cause suck-in. It's actually suck-back or a concave root bead. Uh, furthermore, the heavier coating on, on 7018 interferes the, with the manipulation of the electrode uh, when making a weave. For this reason, a smaller size uh, electrode should be used to weld the root bead if you're welding root bead with 7018. Uh, it has a diameter across the coating that is approximately equal to that of 1 8 inch 6010. What your text is talking about here is making a root bead using 332-7018. If you look at 332-7018 and 1 8 inch 6010, you'll see that their physical sizes are almost identical. Problem with welding a root bead with uh, 7018 is it can cause, cause uh, pinholes and also being a minimum, uh, medium penetration electrode, it's difficult to get good penetration on it. Um, the reason I wanted to mention, mention this stuff is because I do have in my text two questions coming off of page 50 and 51, and one of them comes out of this paragraph. It says, a higher current setting is almost always used for welding with low hydrogen electrodes, and therefore more heat is liberated. The arc characteristic is also different. The low hydrogen electrode produces an arc that is relatively smooth but lacks the penetrating power of the more lightly coated electrodes. So uh, when we come to that section, you'll know why. Uh, You'll know why the uh, uh, welding with 7018 root pass is different. Over on the next page, it says a very, sh I'm still talking about 7018, a very short arc should be used at all times when welding with low hydrogen electrodes. The electrode must be kept very close to the root face in order to obtain adequate penetration. Uh, when the arc is struck, it should be shortened immediately, as explained before. The whipping procedure should never be used when welding with low hydrogen electrodes. A V-shaped weave as shown in figure 518, must be used for welding the root bead entirely around the pipe when using uh, low hydrogen electrodes. The objective of this weave is to allow the molten slag and metal in the puddle to cool and to lose some of its fluidity in order to prevent dripping. Using this weave also prevents, preheats uh, the weld metal ahead. And his, his V groove, or his V weave, is awful, awful similar to that U weave we were talking about to weld a wide root opening. So, uh, out of those two sections are, are where your questions are going to come from on that. Okay, we're down to about three pages. Summary of root bead welding. A perfect root bead should be free from undercuts, porosity, incomplete fusion, insufficient penetration, and excessive penetration. All of these defects can be avoided by learning and practicing the correct welding procedures. Flipping the page to page 54, it says... <clears throat> Welding procedure are not just for information, but must be implemented. The specifics cannot be ignored during welding of an alloy material, nor can the welder fail to follow these written instructions. For example, if preheating and the interpass temperature are ignored, the metal experiences a cooling rate that would likely lead to a martensite structure with poor ductility and toughness. Steel has a tendency to develop a higher level of hardness with an increasing cooling rate. Therefore, it can be difficult to determine if a service failure is due to a, a defective welding or simply when induced brittlement. So again, as we talked about in, in chapter 9, um, follow your WPS, your welding procedure specification. 
especially as you get into higher strength, higher carbon, higher alloy steels. Preheat, watch your interpass temperature, post weld heat treatment, follow what's in your procedures. If you don't know, ask your, your supervisor. And that's all I've got on this. Questions? I know I skipped around a lot, but I just wanted basically to hit the areas where your questions were going to come from. But I would read the entire chapter to put everything in context. I'm, I pretty much kept it in context, but still there's some more information in there that might be beneficial to you. Okay, thank you.